Hi, welcome to the Noise Path. In this episode, we're going to take a look at this Hypo Ultra dielectric analyzer from Associated Research. This is basically a high voltage AC DC source capable of analyzing dielectric breakdowns and safeties and so on. And this is actually the highest model they have, the 7854. And it has a whole bunch of other capabilities. It even has a touch screen in front of it. These things are pretty expensive, I think about nine to ten thousand dollars. But I found this broken on eBay for very little money, just a couple of hundred, so I couldn't resist it and I picked it up. It has a few issues in the front, I think this plastic cover is broken on the inside but it showed that it would turn on and it would just return an error so let me show you what happens when I turn it on it's already plugged in so you can see it has a nice little LCD screen here and once it boots up it just tells you that the calibration is expired it doesn't matter but as soon as you press OK it basically fails this internal self-test it's detecting some voltage at return and if you look at the manual it just says that there's a voltage in the return line where it shouldn't be and potentially there's a problem inside Unfortunately, when I opened it, I discovered why that is, and I can see why it was so cheap. And here's inside of the instrument. It's nicely put together, divided based on the functions of the subcomponents, a lot of subsystem boards, and they can probably mix and match them for the different models this instrument supports. All the low voltage stuff is over here, and all the high voltage stuff is over here. Two absolutely massive transformers, particularly this one. This thing weighs a ton, by the way, because it can deliver a lot of power at high voltages, and it does also have that ground measurement, which puts amps and amps of current through the ground for safety checks. Now, if you look carefully over here, it's clear that something is missing because all these high voltage cables are not connected to anything. There must have been a board here that's now missing. And I feel like this may have been used for a parts unit. You can see there's also a ribbon cable that doesn't go into anything. And even these parts were included, which is nice. So somebody clearly removed the board, put the parts in here to replace it, and then they never did. And I guess this must have been thrown away. But at the same time, it still has the front cover, so it doesn't have a lot of usage on it. So hopefully we can fix it. Now, I had no way of knowing what this thing even looks like on the inside, but Associated Research is part of Iconix USA. And I contacted them, and they were really nice and tried to help me out and find out what board was missing. They actually sold me the replacement board that's supposed to go in here. I haven't tested it, so we're going to have to assemble it and see if it works. But if we can get the whole thing working, that'd be awesome. Then we can also talk about what the high voltage section is actually doing, and let's see if we can bring it back to life. And here is a missing board, which is a high voltage driver board. So all the various cables plugs into here. And this little area is basically this board. So I sp suspect that this is actually sitting on top here. I'm not sure at one point they must have decided to remove the relays and put the diodes on a separate board and separate them from each other. With cutouts, kind of makes sense probably because of the voltage requirements. But yeah, now that I have this, this is brand new just powered directly from them. Let's put it all back together, figure out what goes to what, and we can talk a little bit about the theory of operation on this one as well. All right, so I installed the board. It's fairly logical where it goes because there are not that many connections that you can actually have. The high voltage from the main transformer enters this top board, and this top board reroutes it to the bottom one for the measurement and then ultimately reaching to the front and back of the unit. And this also is responsible for AC to DC conversion. If you watched my video that I did recently on high voltage generation, something similar to this was in different unit I was looking at. I'll show you the schematic of this so we can take a look at it before we turn it on. But this cable was also missing, which I just made one using basic cables and glued it in place. It's not perfect, but it would certainly hold for the purposes of our test. So let's see if this works. So let's take a brief look at the little daughter board that sits on top of the board I just replaced. That board is responsible for conversion of AC to DC, so it basically has some relays and some rectifiers to achieve that. But all of these things have to work at, you know, 5,000 volts. And it's a very simple board in a sense, but the difficulty is in making it work at these really high voltages with the appropriate breakdown. Now, anything that enters that board is going to be an AC signal. So that's transformer directly connected to it, and that's going to be our AC 50 or 60 hertz. Normally, this path is enabled this high voltage relay is closed allowing the signal to go right through it and then from here it jumps out back onto the other board and there is where you have the resistive divider so that you divide the voltage down close the loop and actually stabilize that AC signal anywhere from roughly 0 to 5000 volts but then when you want a DC signal a different path has to be enabled so then this relay would have to open and then this relay would have to close. And in that case, you have a totally different path for the signal to follow, and then you can actually rectify onto these capacitors. And then the signal can then go back, back out this way. And exactly the same loop needs to close. Now, it seems like there is another signal coming here from the low side of the transformer, and perhaps that's the other rectifier. This rectifier is probably active in that sense. I think there's two paths for the DC, if I'm not mistaken. These two other guys are actually do not populate. These relays are very high voltage, 
13,000 volt, I think, is their breakdown, reverse voltage, and I think forward bias voltage is about 50 volts. Plastic package, quite long, so that you don't arc over them. Very common in these type of applications. So the circuit is really simple. Now, you have to be careful to drive in these relays. You can even see that the relays are labeled AC and DC, which are two modes of operation. Because these signals are digital signals, they're actually coming from this low voltage connector, going to the rest of the digital circuitry. So you really don't want anything to feed back if anything goes wrong. So there's multiple protections. There's you know, these two kilo ohm uh, resistors will also act as some kind of a fuse in the catastrophic failure. We have all kind of Zeno diodes protection built in there. But there's also this optocoupler with the Darlington driver that drives this actual coils of these two relays here and here. And that power supply, 24 volts, comes in to make sure the whole thing runs. So really simple, but really complex from a high voltage point of view and if you remember there were all these wires that were jumping across the board and that's the easiest way to connect high voltages from one place to another to just go into a new dimension and we have these high breakdown cables jumping around because it's very difficult to put all the traces on the PCB and you saw that they stack it with the plastic spaces and everything so it clearly needs to be properly engineered but a simple circuit and it works. Mr. Pooch, I think the CAT scan is done you're gonna have to leave during the high voltage testing okay? So let's see if that error is gone now. So turning this on, I removed that calibration warning as well, but hopefully the voltage floating is gone. There it is, look at that, it boots just fine. So you can set up a whole bunch of different tests in here. I've set up a few of them. You can measure AC, DC, ground, integrity, and so on. So in AC mode, you can actually have up to 100 milliamp of current and 5,000 volt, which is a lot of power, and at DC up to 20 milliamp and 6,000 volt. The reason you can have less current at DC is because that current needs to also be supported by the rectifying circuitry and not just by the transformer. So it's a lot harder to get that current at DC. And I think up to 25 amps of current into the ground integrity measurement. So let's see, I've done this such that the AC voltage can now go from zero to 5,000 volts, but it also holds that value so we can adjust it. You can basically set up almost anything in here. There's just so many parameters. This is nice GUI, it all makes sense. It's a pretty good. I'm impressed by how they put this together very, very quickly you can start using it. So we've already done the test, so let's go perform test over here. So 5,000 volt, and then we are at the top, we have the Vitric 4700, which is going to do this measurement for us. Test and test. Let's see, there you go, it's ramping up. It's gonna take five seconds to get to 5,000 volts, and then you should hold it there. And let's see, look at that, 5,008 volts. That's pretty good. So now I can actually adjust it here and go down. So there's 4,990, yeah, it, it looks good. Let's go to 4,900. Let's see if it settles down. Yeah, it's just a few volts off, which I'm sure is because of the calibration. This is a new board, and after all, it's already pretty impressive, and it is as close as it is now. So yeah, you can just go all the way down. Let's say, go to some lower number, 4700. Yeah, it seems to be a, just a constant offset at of the output, which is not difficult to fix. So it's been running for some time now, 200 seconds or so, and it seems pretty stable. And then we can just stop the test, abort that, and now we can go back select a different test, and then try the DC test. It's exactly the same way. We go back, and we go perform test. Now we've got 6,000 volt DC, and we run that now. And let's see if it does the same thing. There you go, 6,000 volt DC is quite a lot. There we go, 6,008, 6,007. Yeah, looks pretty good. It also works, so I should be able to adjust that here as well. So for example, we go down by 100 volts or so, and it goes down by 100 volts. And you can see it measures the currents in the microamp range, so it can measure resistances in the tens of giga ohm pretty easily in both AC and DC. Another interesting thing about this unit is that it can do 50 and 60 hertz, so it's not tied to the line frequency coming in, and I think there's an option that they can do 400 hertz for some of the industrial application. Yeah, it looks good. It's a very nice unit. Certainly a, a big upgrade over the older dielectric analyzer that I have, so I can certainly now get rid of that one. So let's do the ground test connection as well. I was mistaken, this thing can actually do 40 amp RMS of current through the ground, which is a lot. So I've shorted the two terminals together here. Let's see if I can capture that with this clamp meter. Hopefully you can kind of see it. So we're gonna run the test. Let's see what happens. And look at that. That's a 100 amp peak to peak signal that we're measuring. So that's quite a bit. If I should be able to measure the RMS value as well. There you go. Look at that. Exactly 40 amp RMS. Yeah, so it works. So let's go ahead and stress test the capacitor. And no, not that one. This little one. This one over here is a 1000 volts 0.1 microfarad. And we should be able to put 6000 volts across it and see if it survives that, how much margin there is in the construction. 
This bigger capacitor is far more dangerous. This 20,000 volt capacitor is 0.025 microfarad. Actually, I bought that by mistake. I wasn't paying attention and I was trying to buy a different thing. And when this arrived, it was quite a shock to see the size of this. But we'll leave this for a different experiment as it is a quite dangerous thing. Let's try and see what happens to the little one. Okay, let's try this 1000 volt capacitor. I'm going to ramp up to 6000 volts over 15 seconds and then hold it at 6000 volts. I have no idea if this will survive or not, but I think it will be worth trying. Here we go. Let's go. There's 1000 already, so we're already way past the capacitor's rating voltage. Now it's 3000. There it is, it failed. Wow, that's actually pretty good. Let me reset the test. So 3.76 kilovolt, it failed, and it failed at a short, because we got a 20,000 milliamp, which makes sense, because it arced over. Now, whether it's still a short or not, would be an interesting thing to try out. But yeah, about 3.76 times its rated capacity, not too bad, and it failed over 9.4 seconds. Now, despite the fact that the component completely failed and sparked inside as a dielectric breakdown took over, it did not fail as a short. In fact, it still has the 100 nanofarad capacitance it's supposed to have. It is a little bit more leaky than it used to be, but it's interesting to see that. Now, some of that is luck, and some of that has to do with the structure of these capacitance, which is these long, thin films of aluminum wrapped around a dielectric. So we're going to take this capacitor apart, because I do like to see that punch-through area and see how many layers it's gone through, but it's a good sign in this case. So I unwinded the capacitor, and interestingly enough, the failure is actually really, really early on, right at the positive terminal. If you look carefully, it's right here. This is where the spark happened, which kind of makes sense why it isn't open, because it's on the outermost layer. And also, these, all these are still intact, so it maintains the capacitance. But yeah, whatever the positive terminal was connected to, it sparked right across the edge onto one of the lower layers, and that's what destroyed the capacitor. And there you have it. I hope you enjoyed this quick video. It wasn't the most exciting repair in the world, but it is thanks to Iconics that they're selling these individual subsystem components, otherwise we wouldn't be able to repair it at all. So definitely check out the rest of their components they have. These are really nice and capable instruments. I have a whole bunch of other repairs in the queue that I need to complete, so I want to get through all of those. And hopefully you still enjoy this and looking at some of the schematics and internal constructions. See you next time.